Hello, hello. Uh, we're going to start this session. So, uh, welcome at the Midem Lab pitch session. My name is Martin Duval at Blue Nove, and I'll be very happy and excited to moderate this uh, great panel and, of course, the, the pitches from the startup. Uh, this morning, it's all about marketing, social engagement, and the monetization solution at the Midem Lab competition. Uh, so what is about, as a remi reminder, you, you saw a session yesterday, but the Midem uh, uh, Lab uh, features the most innovative startups operating in the inter entertainment field and proposing the, the latest digital innovations uh, that will uh, enable creative industries to build new consumer experiences. So uh, this year, 2015, uh, it's uh, represented by uh, two sponsors, Pepsi and Vivendi. Uh, the finalists have been nominated through a call of entry uh, by the selecting partners, among them uh, Blue Nove, Index Venture, Musical.ly and Sitcamp. As you know, there are three categories uh, and ten finalists uh, in each category. The, the first category was yesterday, Music Discovery, uh, Recommendation and Creation. Uh, now it's going to be uh, marketing, social engagement, and monetization solutions. And this afternoon, uh, please uh, also come back to hear about the hardware and Internet of Things uh, session. Uh, the rule, how it works, it's uh, going to be uh, each startup will have five minutes to pitch, and then we'll be very strict on the five minutes, and then we'll have five minutes session uh, with a great jury here uh, to ask questions. Uh, how is going to happen about the winners? There will be uh, three winners per uh, category uh, uh, nominated by the jury members. Uh, they will be uh, announced during the Medium Innovation Show on Sunday, uh, so tomorrow at 4.30 uh, p.m. in the main room, Riviera 7. Okay, so please, uh, I will remind you that at the end. Uh, the winners will receive uh, free access for one year to Medium, uh, MIP TV and MIPCOM. The, the key entertainment shows of Read Medium, they will also gain free legal advice from uh, Jeff Liebenson from Liebenson Law and also receive a free six months trial uh, uh, of the Strategy I subscription service for tracking global technology, media and telecom markets and disruptive tech trends. Some finalists will also privilege access to the top management uh, of joint sponsors uh, Pepsi and Vivendi during the event and may also receive connections to their global teams after the event for possible uh, business collaborations. The finalists have uh, received a personalized uh, coaching from uh, the official uh, coaching partner, Pepsi. And now, I've been talking already too much, so uh, please help guys, I'm gonna introduce each of you. Uh, uh, we have a, a great panel this morning, a uh, jury comprising of potential uh, business partners, leading investment firms, major tech platforms, and successful entrepreneurs. Influ influential media. Among them, uh, there is uh, Cara Byrne, a freelance technology journalist at Fast Company, and I'll give everybody uh, one minute or two to introduce himself, and then you pick up the mic. There's also Frederick uh, Court, general manager of a new uh, fund uh, he just launched called Felix Capital. Uh, of course, uh, Jason uh, Mandelson, managing director, Foundry Group. And Alex, Alex White is a uh, uh, CEO at Next Big Sound is a former winner at the edition uh, in 2011 and also representing Pepsi and myself, Martin Duval at Blue Nob. So maybe uh, Chiara, one word, and then we'll uh, tell us some more about the jury. Okay, good morning, everyone. So I'm a technology journalist. I do technology features for Fast Company right now, and previously I wrote for Forbes, VentureBeat, and TechCrunch. Hello, good morning. Um, my name is Frederick Court. Um, I'm uh, now under a new uh, banner as I just launched a new venture capital firm called Felix Capital. We just announced a couple of days ago a $120 million fund focused uh, on the creative industry. So we invest in uh, new digital brands and enabling technologies for brands uh, at the intersection of technology and creativity. Based in London, uh, I'm French as you can hear. In fact, I grew up just next door in Nice, uh, but we invest all across Europe and um, uh, selectively in the US as well. Uh, Jason Mendelson, founder group. We're based in Boulder, Colorado. We've got about a billion dollars under management uh, and also helped co-found the Techstars program, one of the accelerators that's uh, populating all over the world. Uh, and also an investor in Next Big Sound. Alex White, uh, co-founder and CEO of Next Big Sound. Uh, two weeks ago, we announced that we sold the company to Pandora, and uh, we're very excited about that. Woo! Uh, I was here five years ago for the first time um, and was fortunate enough to win the Meet M Lab uh, category. 
and uh, honored to be back as a judge subbing in for Ellen Healy from Pepsi, who's a client of ours, um, and excited to meet the companies. How better positive pressure could we put on the, <laughs> on the guys that are going to come on the floor now? So thank you. And uh, we're going to start the session now uh, calling the first uh, startup company called uh, Lanyaka Music with uh, Rebecca Lammers, the founder and CEO. Welcome on the floor, Rebecca. Okay, thank the, you. the floor is yours. So five minutes and you can start. Okay. Hi, my name is Rebecca Lammers and I'm founder and CEO of Lanyaka Music. Lani Ikea is a Hawaiian word that means the immeasurable heavens, and YouTube is the immeasurable heavens of opportunity for artists. Lani Ikea Music is a YouTube multi-channel network that helps artists get discovered and get paid on YouTube. I've been working in the music industry for 13 years, and for the last five years, I've specialized in YouTube. Starting from when I was at EMI Music, I was the YouTube account manager for X Americas, and for the last year, I've worked for the likes of Pink Floyd, Phil Collins, Genesis, Nick Cave, Essential Music and Marketing, Cobalt Label Services, and the list is growing. While I'm talking here today, I'd like you to think of one question. Are you satisfied with your YouTube presence? Most artists will focus on Facebook and Twitter because these are the easier you, uh, social medias to manage. But what they don't realize is that on YouTube is where their new fan base is, and on Facebook and Twitter is where their existing fan base is. And most artists that I speak to, they know they should be on YouTube, but they don't know how, and they don't have the time. And this is where we help. We help artists by monetizing their YouTube channel and user-generated content and forming a, a content strategy. Because the more content you're uploading to YouTube, and the more subscribers that you gain, the more views you're getting, and the more ads are served, and the more money is made. And the great thing about all of this is that the artist doesn't pay us any money up front. All of the money that's generated through ads, the artist receives 80%, and we take 20%. What makes Lanny Ikea truly unique is twofold. First, we are an artist-centric business. This means that we're not just using music videos to push album sales. We're using YouTube in order to push all of the revenue streams for an artist. Secondly, we have a cover video micro-licensing platform where we, where we share the revenues with publishers in a fair and equitable way. So the YouTube multi-channel landscape is made up of mostly general entertainment MCNs. So this means that they're working across all entertainment verticals like uh, gaming, sports, and uh, beauty vlogging. But where the true opportunity is, is in the specialized licensed area. What makes us different from Vivo is that you don't have to be on a label to join our service. And what makes us different from Ind Music, uh, which is a direct competitor, they're based in the US, but we're based in the UK, and we're focused on being a European market leader. So to be a European market leader, we have three different customer segments that we're addressing. First, there's YouTube through the ad revenue share model. Secondly, we have uh, advertisers where we're providing targeted ads, which is higher CPMs uh, and uh, sponsorship opportunities for our artists. And third is through the micro licensing platform where artists pay through a monthly subscription fee or a, a one-off fee depending on their usage. And in order to accelerate and scale this business, we're going to onboard well-known artists early on. So far, we already have established artists, and we have 10 channels on the network. We're, we have uh, 18 in the pipeline, and over 30 artists that we spoke to yesterday were all interested in joining the network. We're also in the middle of negotiating licenses with collection societies and publishers for the cover video licenses. So in order to support all of this, we have a great team. You already know myself and my co-founder, Sunil, who's standing in the back. Um, he's a UK serial entrepreneur and uh, a graduate of London Business School. Our advisors include John Minch from Imagum advising on the publishing side, Yurik advising on sales, and we're currently looking for a strategic advisor who's familiar with the online video streaming space to come on board. So I'd like to finish by saying that we're here to win this competition, but 
if there's any artists or artist managers or anybody that needs help with their YouTube channel, please come and find me afterwards. I am more than happy to talk to you about how we can help you build your YouTube presence. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rebecca. First speech on time and ready for questions. Dear jury, the floor now. Do you have any questions? You have a second mic here. Please keep the mic on next to your chin. Um, so, so if I understand cor correctly this market, it's really about um, giving tools to the artists to monetize, to make money through their, their um, video presence on, uh, on YouTube. But it's also about enabling them to expand their audience. Yes. Um, so how, how do you, on that specific point, you know, compared to other more established players who have you know, kind of bigger reach and many ways to kind of uh, uh, you know, expand, expand reach, how, how do you do that? So, so we have different um, channel segments. So we've divided our channels up into like under 5,000 subscribers, over 5,000 subscribers, and then our top tier uh, channels, which have uh, lots of subscribers. So each of them has a different um, focus. In, in which to grow their fan base. You, you mentioned that there's a direct competitor in the US and that you intend to be the leading Europe. How is the market different in US vis Europe? Why can't the US company come here or you go there? They can, but we're more experienced in the European market and, and we're working on expanding rapidly. Um, actually, I had a similar question to the first one, which, because the, all the artists you mentioned are already well known. So how do you help new artists become discovered? Because I don't think you really answered that question for us. Uh, well, or, well, or to, to grow you, their fan base on. Yeah, I mean, it depends. So like if you're looking at an artist who has under 5,000 subscribers, you, you need to help them get the basics right. So that's where you're giving them tools in order to get um, all, all the sort of like marketing best practice, making sure that they're putting proper annotations on their videos and that kind of thing. Um, so, so that particular customer segment is more about addressing the basics. And then when you get into the higher top tier ones, that's where we're looking at doing sponsorship opportunities for, for the artists. Okay, and that's actually related to my second question, which was the split of revenue between the different sources of revenue you mentioned. So you mm -hmm. had YouTube ad sponsorship and cover micro licenses? Yes. So do you have any idea what the split in revenue is between those three different sources? Or it sounds like it depends on the artist. So it's, it, it depends on uh, the, you know, the, the customer segment. And um, I mean, with the, with the yeah, and it depends on wh which, <laughs> which of those uh, particular customers you're, you're, you're referencing. Was there a specific one that you wanted me to go into more detail about? Um, or? No, I was just wondering if there were any patterns, like is it 10% covers and like 90% YouTube ads or whatever, just that kind of thing. Um, I, we're, we're still building up the network. Uh, w one of the reasons that we're addressing cover artists is because it's a, it's a hugely untapped market. Um, once we hit a certain level, we'll most likely look, look and evaluate, you know, how many original artists do we have on the network? How many cover artists do we have? And then uh, most likely focus more in that area. So I really like the landscape slide with all the YouTube players. I know that the bigger ones, the makers, are actively trying to diversify off of YouTube because it's of over-dependence. Can you talk about um, how YouTube changes affect what you do and how the uncertainty around that platform you know, it presents challenges? Yeah, I mean, I'm well aware of all the other online video streaming platforms and I'm keeping a close eye on them, but YouTube is is mostly it is is very important in the music industry in particular. It's it's still the primary platform for video online streaming promotion and monetization as well. So that's why we're focused on YouTube first. Do you have plans to expand beyond YouTube? Yeah, potentially. It depends on the market as well. Um, one question on on what you offer. Um, so how much is it uh, more kind of? agency commercially uh, uh, commercial type of business versus uh, a technology solution and how much technology investments do you need to make is my understanding of players like um, like makers for instance that they are i mean they've got a very a massive um, uh, team of developers they are building tools um, to um, to help their um, uh, the, uh, the artists that they work with. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not just the agency uh, no relationship, it's also number of technology tools. 
Um, yeah, it, it's both, but what, what we're really focused on at the moment is um, our traction. So our, our next steps are to um, hire and get a business development team in place um, so that we can build the network up and, and get more channels but, on but board. My, my question is more on the technology. So how, how much technology do you provide? 10 so seconds. I, let's, let's go ahead, try to uh, answer. <laughs> It, it, we're using the YouTube platform t for, for our tech at the moment. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, the jury. Here we go, five minutes. <laughs> that was the first speech, so uh, Rebecca did great. And now we're going to get the, the second, uh, th second company, uh, Echo, uh, by the Entertainment Helping Company. And we welcome uh, Scott Ma McElroy, the founder, on stage. Scott, welcome. The floor is yours for five minutes, so get, uh, get ready. Here we go. Let's go. I'd like to tell you a story about an artist who, like most of us, cares about a social cause. Scott, Scott keep, it, keep it next to okay. And this artist uh, decides to engage their fans by giving her the social cause. And the first thing they do is ask themselves, how do I get started? Now, that simple question is the exact reason that Echo exists, simply because today, in 2015, there is no simple service dedicated to artists engaging and even monetizing their fans with the causes they care about. This coincidentally creates a major problem for young fans who we know want to engage and give with the social causes that their, fan, that their favorite artist cares about. So how do we address this problem? quite simply with Music's New Giving Channel, a single dedicated platform dedicated to artists and fans sharing and connecting on the social causes that they care about. In fact, Echo empowers artists to actually sell their content, their merchandise, their music, and their tickets that give transparently to the causes that they care about, which creates a specifically unique opportunity for fans because not only do they get to engage with their artists and the causes they care about, but they also get to receive specific content associated with that cause and that experience. And the proposition for artists is just as simple. Engage your fans in a more emotional and intimate way than ever before. Give them exactly what they want and monetize an aspect of your business, your brand, like never before, and drive more sales and drive more social impact with a cause that you care about. So how does this work? Very simply, when an artist comes to the profile, comes to the platform, they sign up, they select the causes that they care about, they upload the content that they want to sell, and fans come along and they buy that content and obviously give with their artists to a cause that they both care about. Now, more importantly is Echo's aggregation of the entire giving market as it is today, thus maximizing the value and the opportunity for the existing giving partners, all fans, artists, and ex especially marketing brands that want to have a streamlined audience for all their giving in one simple place. Now, quite simply, this is how we make money. Sales is our immediate hook, essentially generating revenue and customers today, where our affiliate and our sponsorship opportunities are very much our long tail, which we will maximize as we grow the platform. Now, if there's one thing I can say confidently, that is that giving is growing and it's growing quickly, where in the US alone, social enterprises are worth more than $2 billion, where we see the music industry giving more than $100 million every year, proving what, what we already know is that artists want to give. And when we start looking at our target market, we see that Echo is positioned specifically between two industries that millennial consumers worship, being music and giving. And when we talk about millennial consumers in general, we can see that arguably the most valuable generation in the world today is growing up, giving to the causes that they care about with the products and the experiences that they're actually paying for. We think this is a sustainable market that we want to be in for a long time. And we're building Echo for all artists, whether it's emerging independent artists or more established artists signed to a major label. We see the opportunity in giving in the millennial demographic big enough for everyone. And with the nonprofits we'll be supporting, currently generating more than $335 billion in the US alone in donations, with a donor base that's aging, they have as much incentive to engage millennial fans as anyone. So where are we now? Well. For starters, we're building a great team in Austin and Los Angeles back in the States. And since launching the platform in January of this year, we've generated more than $10,000 in, in total gross revenue with an average customer spend of roughly $25 a spend. And that's with a $0 marketing budget. So we are currently fundraising our first round of capital. And we do see this opportunity to raise this, the seed capital, seed capital to go out and execute the roadmap that we have in place. So in six months from now, we hope to generate 
more than a quarter of a million dollars from closing that seed round with more than a thousand artists on board. Doing so with our 1.0 app product, a great sales team, and focusing on our B2B partners already in the marketplace. In 12 months, we hope to be sourcing a ticketing integration partner to help empower artists to, s to sell their concert tickets that give to the causes they care about, as well as begin exploring major label deals. We're going to do this with a, uh, a native mobile app and a, and a web API and a web API, excuse me, specifically to help artists em empower their giving from their own websites. Though, in five years from now, we hope to stay true to our name as the entertainment helping company, not just the music helping company, scaling into other entertainment verticals, including TV and film and sports, thus empowering a, a total market worth roughly 1.5 billion to engage their fans with the causes they care about and do so in the most valuable, simple way possible. But until then, we will love music and change the world. Thanks so much. Thank you, Scott. Cool slides, good timing. <laughs> now the jury for questions, please. Yeah. Um, so I like the examples of Drake and Miley Cyrus and all these marquee artists. In my experience, talking to the bigger artists, they're just bombarded with requests to give their time, to give their money, to give their reach to audiences. I'm wondering which artists you've worked with closely that have identified this as a problem where they don't know how to give to charity? Sure. sure, great question. As far as artists that we've worked with today, the vast majority of them have been all independent local artists, frankly, that we've had within arm's reach. So um, establishing relationships with those more established artists, most of them signed to major labels, is definitely something we're, we're pushing to the future, simply because I think the opportunity to support independent artists is much greater where they have more needs for, for different revenue streams as well as engaging their fans with, with different products. So we definitely want to stay focused on the independent artists for as long as possible, um, or frankly just as long until it's necessary until scaling to major labels. Um, where does the money go? Because you have 50% going back to the artist, where does the rest of it go to? So 50% of the money will go back to the artist from a content they sell. The other part will an equal amount from what the artist receives will go to the cause, will go to the 501c3 nonprofit. It's actually not 50%, it's actually 40% of, of, of net revenue. And then we maintain the rest of that. So when you said you had 10,000 in gross revenue, is that 10,000 year bottom line or is that 10,000, which five goes to the artist, four is going to the charity and one's going to you? Correct, it's gross revenue. <coughs> So it, uh, this is a vastly um, fragmented market. Um, and so do you connect to platforms that already aggregate all of these charities and just kind of automate the, uh, the donations? Or do you do that on a case by case basis? No, so that's what our platform is. Our platform aggregates the fragmented market. And if I'm an artist and I want, and my, my charity's not there, how hard is it for me to say, I would like to donate to the cat shelter of Nashville? Yeah, no, it's, it's not hard at all. I'm not sure why I chose that one. But. You like cats. No, um, apparently. In fact, uh, no, it's, it's not hard at all. Most, most of the conversations we have with nonprofits are very simple. Hey, we want to support the cause that you care about and obviously give you money with this industry. So, yeah, it's not hard at all. More questions? Have any of the artists asked you to do any back-end integration as far as tax reporting, anything like that? I mean, they are giving up something of value. Are they asking for deductions and you doing a lot of the paperwork? Uh, actually, no. In fact, that was something that, that we were initially really worried about is, is obviously if an artist gives today, just takes money from their own pocket and gives to a nonprofit, there is that tax deduction. Where a lot of the artist conversations we've had and, and management conversations we've had, label conversations, is that artists aren't that concerned with the tax deduction, especially when, yes, they are for, foregoing some revenue. That's essentially a marketing spend is the, is the way that we position that is you're giving this money in a giving way, in an engaging way, as opposed to receiving it on the back end. How much of the strategy is to build your own kind of ecosystem where the fans are buying there versus plugging in and being more infrastructure layer to where the fans and artists already are interacting? Yeah, I think, great question. As specifically as we scale to other verticals, right now we're solely focused in merchandise. But as we get to digital music and as we get to concert tickets, obviously there's entrenched players and platforms there that we most likely will partner with or, or we definitely plan to partner with in like Y Label in some cases. Yeah, so in the description, you, you refer to a destination marketplace. So that's your main uh, existence is through your, your own storefront and that's where people go? Or is that uh, as an enabler for the 
on the artist site or w w on whichever channel the artist is promoting you? Sure, great question. So a lot of the existing partners in the space are very specific and very niche, whether they give charity auctions or VIP experiences. We want to be a platform where those partners can obviously live and, and reach more artists and reach more fans. So if an artist comes to the platform and finds one of those partners and decides they want to go work with them, do a VIP experience, we will help enable that, that, uh, that experience. Though, um, I think to your question, uh, yes, we want to be the destination. We want to be the gateway, the simple, the simple channel where all giving takes place, whether it's with another one of our partners or, or a specific nonprofit. We want to be the single destination that is on top of mind for artists and fans. No, yeah, yeah. last 30 seconds question. Um, why specifically music? Because it sounds like the giving platform is not specific really to music. You're connecting to all of these different ways to uh, contribute and you could be selling anything, essentially. Sure, no, great question. Um, I guess the specific answer is obviously my, my background was in music and, and music does what other entertainment verticals can't for, for a platform and for a business like one that we want to empower people to give. It makes giving cool just like music does for anything else. It makes, it makes everything cool. And so I think if we can establish our brand and our ethos as in music, this is what we believe and what we stand for, then obviously we can scale to the other verticals much easier. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you for the questions. So that was our second uh, pitch. Now we're going to switch to the third uh, entertainment factory with uh, Bora Turan, the co-founder. Bora, welcome on the, f on the floor. And uh, all right, get your setup ready. There we go. Okay. Five minutes. Hi. Uh, Bora Entertainment Factory. Glad to be here. It's fantastic to be in the entertainment business today because there are new ways of monetizing, there's new ways of creating, and there's new ways of getting to your audience. But there's more to it just than create. All these things that you have to do actually requires expertise, uh, information, and coordination. What we're trying to tackle is, although this seems complicated and overwhelming and difficult, it could be easy. There's a lot of public and private data available, but it's scattered or you cannot get to it. And there's the problem of correlating all these different information, which requires lots of resource and coordination today only majors can handle. Entertainment Factory is actually trying to solve this problem by doing some basics like storing your content, distributing them for you. We are integrated with 250 platforms. We collect all public and private information for you, correlate them, and so you can coordinate your activities with it. Meaning a platform, a platform that can do all these things, so you have one place that you could perform all these activities. A platform that can store your data, Today, other than majors, all the other peoples, all the other people are actually using distributors to store their data. So switching cost of distributors super high. Uh, we distribute your content, no matter what the content is. Again, typically aggregators are typically concentrated on one or two content as we do, we do it for all. We track your sales on a daily basis wherever available, mostly private. We track your promotional plays, mostly public, like YouTubes and SoundClouds. We track your radio and TV plays worldwide on 17 plus platforms, 17,000 plus radios and TV stations. We track your digital charts so you don't have to go to look at iTunes, uh, Shazam or Spotify charts on a daily basis. We do track your official charts on a weekly basis in five countries. We track your social status in all available platforms. We track your online and offline concerts and events. And most importantly, we correlate all this information in one place. We also can help you prevent piracy as well. We are also working on a tool set, I'm gonna tease a little bit, uh, that will enable you to predict your next hit with 80%-ish uh, rate. And we're gonna help you estimating your potential revenue with, with those hits or release. We're gonna help you plan your upcoming tour because one of the information we collect from uh, the sales platforms is location. And we're gonna help you plan your release, whether it should be an album or it should be an EP and an album or two albums. And there's more. 
Entertainment Factory basically enables artists, labels, producers, and studios with a platform where you have services, information, and tools in one location where you can see the entire picture and make smart decisions. Let me show you a little bit of platform. So this is your home screen where you can see your release, latest releases. You can see your uh, daily snapshot of sales, a daily snapshot of where your charts you know, Shazam, iTunes, or Spotify. We can see a, a particular artist uh, social fan base, and you can see recent events. Uh, this is an example of a sales page where you can see all these platforms being, you know, being stacked onto each other for any platform, uh, for any date and timeline you like. And uh, this is specific iTunes sales within those sales and. I mentioned correlation, you'll see on that hovered place where the reason why there's a sales uptick is because there's a new release, there's a chart position in that, in that particular moment, hence the reason you know why you have that. Uh, this is an example of a social page for all those different platforms and it's available in all colors. Uh, we could do the same thing not just for music, for movies, books and apps and everything else. We are in fact working with FMCG company to enable them with the picture. When I ask you where do we stand then, if you look at it, some of those actually being provided by different places, by DSPs today. But what we do is we provide them all in one place. So this is a quick snapshot of a landscape where our competitors are. Luckily, me, you know, next big sound is right here. I'm finishing, one more slide. And uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Time, time is time. Five minutes. I'm, I'm, I feel sure. bad. I feel bad. But uh, don't worry, That's Bora. Right. I'm sure you're gonna have the questions too. Absolutely. I'm sure to to tell more about that. So let's switch to the jury and the uh, questions. I've got some. <laughs> I've seen Good. See, see, I told you. Um, <laughs> so where are you at with the building of all of this? Actually, all of them are working except the tools. Our solution. I see as a threefold. One is the basics, where you store information, metadata, and you know the content itself, which is actually a big problem people don't notice. Secondly, we distribute them. Uh, this is basics, and then there's the uh, there's the there's the layer of transparency where you can see the complete picture. That's basically what you do in most senses. And the third phase is actually where you can make impactful changes based on what you see, which are the tools, except the tool part that are in development, everything is actually functioning today. So have you, have you launched this and have you got customers? Or? We do. We actually, today we have uh, five songs. Let me put it this way. I moved from US to Turkey to run Microsoft online operations. Hence the reason companies established in Turkey. So currently we have Turkey and Benelux office. And we do have four songs in the iTunes top 25 today. Uh, f you know, four songs in both countries. Who do you have customers? Sorry, 4,000 what? We have four songs uh, four in the songs. top 25 of iTunes today in the countries we operate. Okay. How much Clear, does this cost? Okay. <laughs> how, who, who pays you and how much? Basically, it's my own funds. I used to work no, for Apple. No, 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 no customers. Your customers yeah. Oh, customers. Uh, yeah, revenues. It's basically, uh, one of the slides that I didn't have a chance to show you is we work in two models. One is commission-based distribution, typically, and the tools would be an additional uh, percentage. So it's typically, we try to give customers the uh, within, uh, distributions between 20% and 30% range. We try to give customers more within that 20, 30% range. And the other one is some of those services, like uh, music metric services, that would cost them per artist. So one of the challenges, um is if you're doing distribution, then you can see all this great data back, but then you have to are competing against every other global distributor. If you're just tracking the online activity or kind of public data, then you can see comprehensively, um, and you can deliver a lot more insights about you know, what's happening. So how do you get to scale on the distribution side so that you can provide the valuable stuff there? Because you're competing against the orchard and, and sure. everybody uh, else. Actually, before the Microsoft board, I actually worked for iTunes. I was one of the early uh, Microsoft, uh, iTunes guys. I run the operations for music store, app store, and bookstore. So one of the things that you have is typically the distributors, the aggregators, 
started organically, started small, and then they grow big. And they typically have a lot of um, infrastructure issues. They, they, because they grew out of nothing, you know, they became huge. We start with the opposite. Since I had a chance to see how they did it and what's wrong with them, we tried a different approach. The other thing is, the way they did it, they actually wanted to give you more services than distribution. But what they did, they went ahead and they just had agreements with the other parties. And they said, if you want to have a, you know, work with you, for example, you know, work with Next Big Sound, you got 20% off. We do the opposite way. We, we, we provide an experience where everything is within the platform. For example, um, the privacy and the radio tracking is totally doing, is being done by third parties. But you wouldn't even feel that it's third parties unless you know, we say powered by music DNA or link busters. It's like the difference between Microsoft and Apple, where one, you work with different applications, and the other one is completely integrated. More questions, yeah. Um, so I'm less familiar with the, that specific market in terms of who is competing there, but you, you basically have the distribution model and the um, uh, kind of um, you know, SaaS solution for metrics, uh, which sounds to me you know, pretty interesting, but it, it, which is most or least competitive and which is most open to you? I think both markets are competitive. One of the slides I didn't have a chance to show, uh, in, in both markets, the distribution market as well as data market, you know, what I see are our competitors are already acquired, so we think we're on the right path. So by building everything in one place, you would have the opportunity to see through, like what you just mentioned, if you don't have sales information, you've got all this great information about social media, that you can't really correlate them, or you have resources to be able to sit in a, you know, in a table, have a meeting and talk about to correlate them. This does it for you. So it levels the field for majors as well as little guys in these. And does it for, I'm sorry, does it for all content types, not just music. So is this like the buzz deck a wall. This is actually kind of playbook. Buzzdeck Plus. Tara, last one. Okay. Um, I see the real value in this is the tools, actually, but you don't have them yet. So, how far are you from being able to roll out those tools and actually to prove that those tools can help you make decisions which will make you more money? So, tools will be available by the end of August. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mara. Thank you. You did great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> lots of applause. And uh, now we're going to welcome the fourth uh, pitch. So Unique Sound from USA with Romain Cochet, the CEO. Romain, welcome on the floor. Ready, Romain? OK, five minutes. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here. My name is Romain Cochet, co-founder and CEO of Unique Sound. We are building the first platform to find hire and work with music composer. Where do you go when you need to find a designer? To be ends, right? Or where do you go when you need to find a mechanical engineer to grab CAD? And where do you go when you need to find an, an interior designer to house.com? But now, where do you go when you need to find a music composer. Nowhere. Nowhere because there is no central place to go. And it does not make sense. Most content need music. Commercials, web series, video games, apps. Millions of buyers need composers and even Katy Perry need composers to create their music. <coughs> Global brands, advertising agencies, multi-channel networks, they all need composers to create music. And they just have no easy way to connect with the three million composers looking for job opportunities. So again, it does not make sense. At Unixam, we are solving this problem. We connect directly buyers to composers. Let me show you how it works. This is Charlie. Charlie is a composer on Unixam. Charlie can now create his portfolio. He describes his skills, background, awards, 
Then he posts his best projects with client reviews and uploads his entire music catalog that he wants to monetize. Buyers can now find Charlie, browse his music and start working with him. Buyers can now find great composers and start working with them. Just like TBWA, who requested the music for Nissan, and here is the result. That's really, really cool. I love it. Um, and, and that's the way the composer made more than $2,000 in a few hours. When we started to onboard composer 12 weeks ago, we had zero composer. Now we have more than 600 hand-picked composers. They come from more 35 countries in the world. And from new talent to Emmy Award winners, they all show a huge interest. Just like these first adopters who have already recognized the value of Unix Sound to find a composer and get music. So now, how will we monetize? Unix Sound is a one-stop shop for all music needs. And we will make, we'll make money in two ways. First, we'll take a 35% fee on every transaction made on Unix Sound and additionally, there are a number of features that both composers and buyers are willing to pay. We are the right team to do it. We know music. After college, I founded a music marketing agency. I took it from scratch to two million in revenue with offices in Paris and Hong Kong. We know how to scale a platform. Cedric was a CTO of a vc backed marketplace in Europe. And we know execution, we like to go fast, maybe because Alex was in charge of operation at the leading high-speed train company in Europe. Our playground is video content and music market, and we have a huge opportunity to quickly capture the 5 billion addressable market. This market will double in the coming years as online video content is booming. At Unix Sound, we are building a place that both composers and buyers will call home. So from putting a sound in every piece of micro content to making the next hit of Katy Perry, Unix Sound will be there. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Romain. <laughs> Questions? 35% um, is pretty high, so how, okay, I know you're very young, you're only 12 weeks old, but how many uh, projects have actually been booked already through the site? Sure, so my first answer is it's not high if you compare with like all the stock music libraries and all the way to find music today. If you go through a music houses, you will get more than 60, 50 or 60% commission. If you go on Shutterstock, it's 70%. If you go on Getty Image, it's 60 or 65%. So 35 is pretty fair, and it's totally reasonable for both buyers and composers. Um, so when we started Unix Sound at the beginning, in October in France, we started by matching manually composers and buyers. We did more than 50K in sales to understand the market. Then we moved to Techstar New York. We stepped back to understand the landscape and we decided to launch this open marketplace and to focus both on co first on composers because composers create the value. And that will be always the same, same thing. They create the value. And since we started 12 weeks ago, we had around 10 projects and for instance, Vice Media came three times in Unix Sound to find Composer and get music. So one of the problems with marketplace businesses is, is a composer meets a buyer, they fall in love, and then they start emailing each other outside your platform and they start doing deals outside of your network and you don't get paid. How do you prevent that? Are there other services or other things that you're gonna add to keep the platform sticky so people don't try to work around? I'm happy you asked this question because this is our main risk. And um, 
we um, I do not have the exact right answer right now, but we have options. And first is to secure the payments. When you w when we work with freelancers, they all will always need to be like secure about the payment. And when we did the project with Vice, all the composer says, "Can you secure my payment first? So first option. Then secure the, the legal part. Or can we be sure that the contract is fine for both composers and buyers? Of course, we need to hone the communication within the platform and not outside. And last thing that we cannot underestimate is that e-reputation e is crucial. Our job is to make composers more professional. So the idea is to say, if you do business outside the platform, you will not be able to, be like, to, to get client reviews. If you do it in the platform, you will get client reviews, you will be curated, and then at the end, you will get more jobs. Yeah. Hello. What have you found to be the most successful ways or, or channels to acquire composers? Because I know they're hard to Yeah, definitely. Find. I mean, the pain we are trying to, to solve is finding easily a composer online. We did experience it by doing it. And we, we tasted many, many scripts and ways to acquire our composers. So today, our uh, way to find them is quite simple, we screen on dedicated, dedicated website, just like Out of the World or Vimeo, we have our secret source, which are keywords we can, we, can, uh, we can tape, and then we curate every composer, and then we call them, and then, and then they join. We have a 80% conversion rate today. When we decide to onboard a composer, eight out of 10 join Unix Sound. Yeah. There. Um, you mentioned five billion dollar market. Yep. Um, so that's the value going to composers. Exactly. Yeah. And how much of that is uh, you know, people working for Katy Perry versus people working for Nissan? Um, so for Katy Perry, uh, I mean, more, you know, like artists, artists versus uh, brands. Um, so licensing about like large artists is a small part. Um, I'm sorry about that, but I, I don't have the exact number. I think it's 500 million, so it's, 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 a small, it's a small number. And you know, the real market is a hand-to-hand, -hand. because who can afford Katy Perry or large artists? I mean, Pepsi, maybe, but Pepsi only for big projects. And, and then, so the, the, it's mostly the brands, but do the brands buy directly, or are you really selling to the agencies? Last question. Yeah. The only good answer, it depends. And so when we started by doing like the, the 50 first cane sales, we had both buyers, uh, ad agencies, production agencies, directors, and brands. And what we understood is like when it's a small project, it's brands directly. And when the project is bigger, like commercials or big online content, uh, it's ad agencies or video production. Thank you, Roma. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for timing. Um, the next uh, startup is Vinylit from uh, France, before we had countries like UK, USA and Turkey. So now it's France with Pierre Crève, co-founder. Okay, Pierre, welcome on, on the floor. You have five minutes, Pierre. Okay, get ready. Get your mic on. Get it close Does it to work? your mouth. Very okay, good. It okay. works. Let's go. Um, so, hello, I'm Pierre Kreff. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Vinylit. Uh, I was working for Universal. I own my own record label, and I am also organizing some dub sessions in Paris. Uh, Vinylit is a platform where diggers can create their own vinyl record from a catalog of tracks that have never been released on this format before. Thus, record labels and, arti and artists can make their old releases available on vinyl record, here, sorry. Because today there is a big problem. It's about 90% of the music which is released is not available on vinyl record because it is too expensive and too risky to press it. Uh, for instance, two years ago, with our own imprint, we've experienced this problem, and that's why we decided to create it Vinylit, because we knew that other people, other record labels, had the same problem. Because this problem creates two frustrations. On one side, 
Diggers have only have access to 10% of the music on, this, on their favorite formats. And on the other side, record labels are missing out potential revenues on those releases. So now there is a solution, and it is our platform, Vinylit. By signing a um, license contract on vinyl cutting, record labels can integrate their track on our platform. Then the digger comes on vinylit.co, he selects his tracks, he creates his stickers, select his sleeve and will uh, get his record, unique record delivered in eight days. And for that, uh, the record label will be given one euro of royalties for each track sold on the platform. And uh, here is the result uh, of what we do. Here is the EP that we couldn't press two years ago, so now it's available on Vinylit exclusively. And other people than me ordered it. Also, we make a special uh, record for Medium Lab with the best track of our platform. So if, if you want to check it, you really Thank should. You. So those records prove that we are a new way of distribution and a new way of monetization for record labels. But most of all, we are a new way of digging for record diggers. And one thing that is interesting is that we are totally compatible with other vinyl companies in the industry. As you know, record uh, vinyl record is a niche in the music industry, and we, ended, we identified three main actors. First, there are the classic retailers, like independent record stores, like um, online shops and like subscription services, but they sell already existing vinyl records, so they don't sell the same products than us. Then there are the vinyl cutters. We work on the same machine than them, but they don't give access to a catalog. They don't have the rights, and they don't have the master to do it. So they are not really competitors. Then there are also the crowdfunding platforms like Curates, like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, like Hulul. And a lot of projects succeeded on those platforms, and this is really good for record diggers like me and you. But most of them failed, and we, uh, we could be an alternative for those projects. So. As you can see, we don't have for now direct competitors on this segment. We are really the first platform to create your own vinyl record <coughs> and maybe the only fools to get into this adventure. But we're not really fools because we have a business model. It's based on two main things. The first one is the long tail. We gather all the low demand tracks on our platform to link them and, and finally to sell it. So the, the more tracks we have, the more record we sell. And this gives us our first revenue stream because we're on five euro on each, on each personalized record when we give four euro to the record labels. Then we also gather data because we know what our users listen, what they buy, what they request, what they search on the platform. And we are now able to release uh, limited edition compilations. We made it one month ago with a dub, dub compilation and it works really well as we sold more than 100 copies of this, uh, of this uh, compilation. So if we look what has been done since uh, six months online, uh, more than 50 record labels decided to join us, and there are a lot of more in the pipeline. We gather more than 3,000 tracks, we ship two or three records a day, and we have a customer satisfaction of 99%. So imagine if we add 5 million tracks in our catalog. Um, Next big step uh, for Vinylit is the release of the version 2, the release of the back office for record labels, and two new compilations. And uh, Clément, my uh, de web developer, is not here, he's really sorry, but he has a word to resume our uh, concept. Done, Pierre. Thank you. Wait, I'm sure. It's okay, it's sorry for Clément. Clément, sorry about that. Next time. Uh, timing, Thank you. Uh, timing is tough sometimes. Okay, we have now uh, five minutes yeah. questions. Thank you, Frédéric. Yeah, so f first question, um, how big is the vinyl market these days? Uh, you know, Sorry? What's, your, what's your market opportunity? So how big a market is it? Uh, uh, how many people uh, still have? Today, uh, vinyl market represents 3% of the, of the music industry, uh, but it, it's growing like 50% um, every year. And uh, some specialists say that it could represent in 2020 like 10 or 20 percent of all the music industry. So I think this is good news for us, and we arrive at the good moment. So I joined the advisory board of a vinyl subscription service, Vinyl Me Please, and I know that there's like price breaks as you get to 500 um, orders of 500 or more. 
I'm wondering if you can talk about the economics of, you know, like what did it cost to make that medium? Oh, uh, if you want to buy it, because it's the best record that we can do, it's 40 euros. So you will tell me that it is expensive, but price is really relative because, you know, uh, record diggers, they are like nerds. So when they are looking for a specific track, the price is not so, th th they don't give a look at the price. And the proof is that uh, with only 300 tracks, we, we sell it. It was about the cost. Uh, ah, about the cost. Uh, um, on this record, uh, we have 20 euros of production. Uh, we have 4 euros of royalties for the record labels. We have 3 euros of uh, um, neighboring rights for collecting societies because we declare uh, each record we produce. Then there is uh, 5 euros for vinylit and the VAT in France, which is 20%. So who's remastering all these tracks? You can't just take digital tracks that were meant for MP3 or CD and dump them on the vinyl. That no. doesn't work. So you we have don't. To, you got to re somebody's going to have to go through the trouble of remastering every song. That's uh, what we do. Who do. You do that. I don't do that. Uh, we are three on the project, so. Uh, but who's doing that work? Valentin. Valentin is doing that work. Is uh, cutting vinyl records since ten years on a record cutter. It's a, the machine is called Vinyl Recorder, and when we have an order, we master the uh, basically the four tracks that have been ordered, and then we cut it directly on Vinyl Records. And uh, all the labels that joined us uh, validated the the quality of the sound of the of our records. Um, what do you think the biggest obstacle is to this becoming a much bigger business than it is right now? If there was one thing, if there was one thing to become bigger? Yes, the biggest obstacle you have to get over to make this into a, a much bigger business. Um, it would be to have big partnerships with uh, distributors that we could uh, uh, integrate like 50,000 tracks in one partnership and we are doing this and it will be done in September. But the question was obstacle. This is what you have to do, but what would stop you from doing that? What, what would be the main, you know? Uh, you know, element that would stop you from getting bigger? Uh, uh, the main obstacle uh, would be that the record labels think that we don't uh, uh, offer uh, uh, a new concept, a new value, and uh, that they would think that uh, they will, uh, the, the service would not be uh, needed for them, but it is. In your first sales, where are they coming from geographically? Uh, so, 90% of our sales come from France, but we are now shipping uh, 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 records in uh, Germany, in Belgium, in Italy, in UK, in Slovakia, in Denmark. So, uh, with the time, we, we, we released the English version uh, one month ago, and uh, that gave us some uh, orders from other countries. Uh, and so you mentioned earlier that this is um, this cost, uh, or do you sell it for 40 euros? Mm -hmm. But you collect five for your business. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, so you uh, and there yeah, there are no ways for you to build your gross margin on these products because that's quite a low gross margin. No, uh, because it, uh, that's why we that's why we we release a, a limited edition compilation because when we sell a record at 40 euros, we make five euros, and when we sell a record at 17 euros, the dub compilation and the hip hop compilation, who will come in uh, in September, uh, we earn four euros. So it's uh, like three, uh, 30 percent margin on the compilations. I don't think we have any more questions. So, Pierre, thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Great, thank uh, you. great pitch. We had so far uh, five startups. Uh, don't forget, because we may keep it, so we like it very much. So, uh, we have five more startups to go, and now we welcome on, on floor the um, Linkfire from Denmark with Lars uh, Etrup, the CEO. Welcome, Lars. You're gonna have five minutes to uh, convince the jury that you are the best. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thanks to the Orchard for a great party yesterday. Um, I'm Lars. I'm the CEO of Linkfire. Um, <coughs> Linkfire is a marketing tool. Lars, keep, keep the mic close to you. Hello. Yes. Linkfire is a marketing tool, B2B uh, marketing tool for record labels, music distributors, uh, music professionals, basically. We're based in Denmark. We're a small team of eight people started about 12 months ago. We create links, 
basically, link fire. Um, why we create links is because uh, our clients deal with a very complex scenario. Um, their artists uh, deal with a global audience when they're marketing their music, basically. Case an example is Taylor Swift on her uh, Twitter profile. If she posts a link to her 60 million fans, she's ideally addressing 60 million uh, audiences with different uh, music preferences. They have different streaming services, they have different uh, download services that they use to consume their music. Um, she has 140 characters to basically speak to that audience. Um, we create a universal link that basically um, will automatically deep link whatever consumer clicks the link into the most uh, accurate, the most appropriate uh, music service. So um, we created a, a really simple tool for uh, record labels, for marketeers to sit and create these uh, links that they then use on social media, email marketing, paid media. Um, we create links. We make it very easy for them to create links. Um, basically, we have an a automation uh, setup. So basically, um, you simply type in Taylor Swift, and we will basically start scanning a lot of metadata, a lot of APIs, and we will automatically, within 30 seconds, know where uh, the album that you're linking to or the track that you're linking to exists right now across 300 different platforms. And uh, we'll basically create a, a unified uh, link for you. We will create a small landing page for you in a matter of, of, of seconds. And you can take this link and you can paste it on social. You can embed it on your blog. You can basically do whatever you want with it. And we'll automatically route the consumer into their preferred streaming service. In this process, when a consumer uh, clicks on our link, we collect a lot of data, obviously. We collect where the consumer has uh, clicked from, and we also collect data on did they actually buy or, st or stream anything in that process, which allows us to give you full funnel insights. So basically, we can say this link got 10,000 clicks that resulted in X amount of downloads on iTunes, from Denmark, from Snapchat channel, and so forth. So basically, we provide you very granular uh, data that you can drill down into. We also collect uh, audience pools. Basically, we provide you, uh, our clients, with a very good understanding of where are their audiences located. Um, we can provide our clients with trends and obviously also uh, remarketing capabilities. We are a subscription-based company. Uh, we have a very simple uh, revenue model. Uh, we charge 850 euros uh, per month. Basically, we provide unlimited usage. Obviously, our mission is to provide you know, uh, more value ongoingly and thereby increase the price uh, slightly. Market potential with this revenue is slightly limited if you look at it from a venture point of view. If you look at it from a business point of view, it's pretty, pretty good. Um, we focus on record labels, music distributors. We're also interested in two other verticals, film and TV and books. And that's primarily because they have the same pain points. You have a piece of content that exists in multiple end destinations that you don't control, and you have to link your audience into that. We have a one sole strategy, and it's a land grab strategy. We focus on uh, major labels, big independents, and uh, music distributors. Uh, we're here to obtain a strategic position. We want to be the de facto platform that all marketeers log into every morning when they control their digital campaigns. Um, key numbers, we are cash flow positive. We've been that from day one, basically. We have 99 clients. Uh, I have six seconds. That's it, the future, US, film, books. That's it, I'm out. Thank you. Future in six seconds, but we have more questions to talk about your future. So let's switch to the questions. Um, so how, I know that Gupta Media is the creator of Smart URL. Is that the only real competition? I know it's pretty embedded in the US, for instance. And how do you plan on, on changing that? Yeah, so we work with Gupta Media. So uh, we have 
two competitors basically. And um, all of our competitors are owned by media agencies. We're independent, so we allow our uh, labels to um, sync with any media company basically. It gives us a huge advantage. So we actually sync with Gupta Media. So they do their spend on Gupta and then track or link. We collect the data. Yeah. Gupta activates the data basically. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, Smart URL, ba you know, created five years ago, based in US, have a huge advantage in that matter. Um, have an inferior tool to us basically, um, and um, yeah, we're gonna win that. Question, Frederick. So uh, can you take me through the specific tools you offer to the music industry versus other uh, um, solutions that, uh, that enable link creations? Because I, I would have thought that that was becoming more of a utility now. There are many people who can do links, but what's your kind of industry specific uh, value, value add? Sure, I mean, uh, links is basically 1% of what we do. It's the outcome of what we do basically. So we created a tool that allows um, uh, record labels, for example, to coordinate all the stakeholders in the various countries to you know, look at the insights, look at the stats, easily collaborate with each other. Uh, there's a lot of affiliate programs from each country. We allow them to put that into the tool. There are a lot of retargeting or remarketing requirements. Uh, we put that in the tool also. And then we basically automate this whole thing by, you know, it takes 30 seconds for them to create a link. We scan a lot of music specific metadata basically and create this kind of unified link um, so it really solves a lot of pains for that specific industry it's it's not just to take a long link and make it short that's that's what they've been doing for many years basically yeah. did you say you had 99 clients yeah something like that yeah. so and if it's 850 euro a month and 99 clients, how do you come to only estimate a revenue of 320 euros a no, year? We don't monetize all of our clients yet. So what percentage of your clients are you monetizing and what percentage are paying the full price of 850 a month? We're monetizing 31. We have 31 licenses that are paying at the moment. And of course, we're, we're interested in increasing that basically. Um, but we have a very uh, no cure, no pay kind of approach to it. There's not that many potential clients for us out there you know it's, it's you know the industry is dominated by a few majors a few in so we have a very much kind of a co-development approach with them basically do you have a question Kara? or it's okay no 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 it's okay yeah is there existing tools in book publishing or other verticals already out there so like entrenched players focused on those the the sole reason why we are working with music interested in film and books is that there are virtually no competition, basically. Uh, we could move into gaming, but it's a very competitive uh, space, so we remain in those three verticals. The jury seems uh, fed <laughs> with your answers, so thank you so much, uh, Lars. Great, great pitch. Thank you again to uh, Linkfire. Uh, we have now a company from UK, Campaign Amp, with uh, Ian Hager. Founder and CEO, welcome on the floor and uh, get ready for your five minute speech. Mike, Hello. really? All right, let's go. Hi, Lawrence. thank you. Thank you for having me this morning. Uh, we are from Campaign Amp. My name is Ian Hager, I'm the CEO and co founder. Um, this is my partner and uh, CTO, uh, Alex. Um, I spent my uh, career working in uh, music, brand, and event marketing at Ministry of Sound um, before I left to set Campaign Amp up. Um, Campaign Amp is a business-to-business -business collaboration and analytics tool that aims to get teams of marketeers working more effectively together on their campaigns using their data. We launched in 2014 and we've spent the time building out our client base and building our small, small team. So we look at two main problems. The first, in a world that in is increasingly uh, driven with uh, decisions based around data, we believe that if you don't understand the context that your data lives in, then you don't fully understand your data. And I use a, an example to illustrate my point. So if you imagine that all the logos on the screen in front of you are individual pieces of campaign data, so that could be paid for marketing, it might be PR, it might be social media data, or it might be, um, it might be revenue generating data. But if you don't understand the relationships that tie all of those key data points together, they very quickly disappear into the midst of everything else that you've got going on in your campaign. 
and its context that handily joins all the dots and allows you to see your most important data points, and more importantly to that, understand why they are important, and it's the why that we deal with. <coughs> the second problem we look at is one of inefficiency, and this was the frustration that drove me to start the business in the first place. I was really frustrated with my teams at Ministry spending far too much of their time on reporting what was going on, and we estimate that at a minimum, 25% of total campaign time is wasted through inefficient communication. When you start to add that up, a team of 20 people over three months is a pretty big problem. And ultimately, it's driving re um, revenue down. Because if you've got blockages in your communication, your campaigns aren't maximized, and therefore they're not driving as much revenue as they could do. So, Campaign Amp adds context to data and drives efficiency. But what is it? We've taken the best features of a project management platform and the best features of an analytics tool and mashed the two things together into one platform. And that makes us unique in that we're the only platform that allows teams of marketeers to connect up all of their most important feeds of their data and then work directly alongside that data in the same platform. We're in the cloud so they can log in from wherever they are on any mobile device and stay instantly in contact with what's going on in their campaigns at any time. We call this process intelligent project management. And really what we're trying to do is turbocharge the project management function by adding data to the mix as the fuel. And it's because we've got marketing, comms and salespeople all working together on their campaigns in one place that they're more easily able to work out what's working, what's not working and make quick speedy decisions about how best to deploy their resources, tasks, budget to the right thing at the right time to make the most of what they've got. Because we've got everything in one place we can also drive efficiency through the whole process. So routine tasks like creating reports that can take hours per campaign, we've got that down to a matter of seconds. We also handle asset management. We've got a built-in storage area called the resource bank that allows teams to share approved campaign assets very quickly from wherever they are and also acts as a storage area for all the content that's generated during the course of executing a campaign. So at the end of your campaign, you've got a record of all the great content that's been generated by the team, stored right next to all the information. So we think we got off to a pretty good start, and in terms of revenue, we're up 75% quarter on quarter. In terms of the numbers of messages that are being sent via our platform, so messages, reports that are being shared by teams, we're up 36% quarter on quarter. We're working with some of the biggest global entertainment brands and I'm really pleased that we're working with all of the major labels in the UK and also working right across the music ecosystem. So labels, event companies, management companies, PR companies and, and media agencies. And outside of music, in film with Universal Pictures and in book publishing. We're also in multiple territories, running campaigns in the US, the UK, Europe, Middle East and Australia. We have a flexible model we have a SaaS model, subscription per campaign, but also we've got a load of enterprise deals that we've signed on an annual basis as well. Um, and we also have a, a, an innovative license arrangement with our media agencies we're working with. What are we looking for? Well, we've got off to a, hopefully what we think is a decent start, but we've got a long way to go. And we would love to win Medem Lab to get the validation from you guys to say, yes, we're doing quite a good job. Outside of that, we'd love to be working with any new customers in the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Question, dear jury. So you launched in 2014? Yeah. So what have been the biggest challenges in the past year to getting this off the ground? Changing the way that people work. It's a, it's a difficult challenge because you're asking people to change the way they work with email and Word documents and PDFs and PowerPoints and all that stuff that they're used to and start to work in a different way. And the, the, the way that we've done that is hopefully to make the whole thing more efficient for them so they get an instant sense, okay, actually this can work for us. <coughs> So, so where is the data coming from? So we, so, so, so we see Campaign Amp basically sitting at the middle of, of, of a campaign, like the glue that binds everything together. So information comes from people entering it, so the, the team actually putting in, we're doing this, this is the person we're speaking to, etc. But we also connect directly into APIs in the same way that Next Big Sound does. Um, we also we can connect into data warehouses. We connect into any other tools that the teams are using, so we don't do social listening, for example. So, but people can connect in Brandwatch or whatever tool they're using or uh, mailing services like MailChimp, that kind of stuff. And we're also bringing data in via spreadsheets because spreadsheets are still widely used to share data around businesses. And we just map those and allow teams to sort of get over that hump very quickly and start using the platform quite quickly. 
So are you focusing on music or are you studying music? No. Well, what, my background what? was music, yeah. so that was how I got we okay. got the business up and running. But it was always the vision from the start that it wasn't just a problem that was typical to the music industry. It was across every industry. We're very focused on trying to stay pretty tight at the moment because we're a small team. Um, but we are having conversations with brands like Diageo and uh, agencies like Havas and Clark Shoes and people like that, where we're just sort of starting to uncover whether it can work in those as well. But certainly film and books are, are priority markets for us. And so how much are you charging your customers at the moment? <laughs> well, it slightly varies. So we have a, a, a scaled pricing model. So at the top end for everything in music is £150 per campaign per month per territory. Because the idea is that you get teams in each territory working on their campaigns together. But that scales back to you know, independent labels who may not have the same size of campaign and not the same budgets, or down to the PR companies we're working with who can just use the PR-focused dashboards and their, their price is a lot less, but they're running much more volume of campaigns through us. Clara, uh, sorry. Okay. Um, of the people who are on your platform, what percentage of them are using this on a daily or weekly basis? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, everybody's using it on a weekly basis. Um, uh, and uh, that's a very good piece of data that I should have at my disposal, and I don't. But everybody's using it on a weekly basis because they're logging in and using it to run reports and update what they're doing on a weekly basis. Yeah. What we're trying to do is engage people to come back to the platform as much as possible. So we've just upgraded all of our messaging functionality so that you can now message from anywhere on any dashboard about any piece of data with one click to blast out to the, to the team or to any individual on your, on your team. And how much time are you spending having to sit beside your users and train them how to use this? As you said, it's a new way to work. How yeah. much right now are you spending on the services side of the business? Yeah, it's a good, another very good question. And quite a lot of time at the moment is the honest answer. Um, I mean, mate, but it's also a good way of engaging with those businesses because I'm in those businesses all the time. And we're also talking to them all the time. So rather than just being a bit remote, through uh, you know, video tutorials and that kind of stuff, which we do have, and we've got a full help section and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's, at, at this stage in our growth, it's quite important for us to be in those businesses and talking to those people on a daily basis and getting the feedback directly. And last quick one, what do you think the revenue potential on a yearly basis is just in the music industry in the next couple of years for your company? <sighs> Uh, okay, just in the music industry, well, we think the, the uh, music industry total addressable market is about half a billion. Um, and when we start to factor in the film and, film and uh, 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 publishing industries, we're up to about 1.6 billion. Um, and we're looking at about 1% of that over the next two or three years. Um, the key statistics you gave us was that you saw people were wasting 25% of their time on your own campaigns. So do you have stats from your customers which prove that they're actually saving some of that time when they're mo using your tool? Um, we, don't have, we don't have stats on it, but we've got anecdotal evidence of, from, the, from the companies who are using us where our tool is now firmly embedded in those businesses. So PR companies who are using us to run 120 campaigns a month, for example, they're now telling us that they can't strip out our, our, our tool because their teams would just go mental. So, you know, it's... I'd like your opinion on Percolate and NewsCred. Are you familiar with those services, the content marketing platforms? Um, no, not, not, not particularly, no. They're doing a lot of marketing workflow analysis stuff right. that seems very simple. Okay, I'll take a look at them then. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, thank you so much Thanks. for your pitch. Uh, we're going to have now a company from the UK called Dice with Russ Tannen, the head of music. I see Russ. He's almost running on the floor. Welcome. Okay, Russ, you have five minutes. Hi, I'm Russ Tannen. I'm the head of music at DICE, which is the fastest growing event discovery and ticketing app in the UK. Um, my background is actually in management, and it was at our management company that we started to really look at ticketing and start to think that maybe it wasn't just this unsexy part of what we did, but actually something that was completely broken. And we started to listen to what, our, what the fans of our artists were saying about ticketing, about buying tickets to the shows, and also about what the artists themselves were saying about it. And we started to look at how we could go about fixing it. One of the first things we decided was that it had to be mobile. Um, not just because of the statistic behind me, um, because of the um, extra security benefits of doing a mobile ticketing platform, protecting us against bots, um, and also the better communications methods with uh, push notifications. Um, we also decided that it had to be curated. We didn't just want to do another ticketing app which was trying to list every single event happening in every city. We just wanted to do the best events happening in your city or the city you happen to be in. 
Um, and also we decided that we had to get rid of booking fees. It was the main constant in all the feedback that we had um, and something that as fans ourselves was really frustrating, sometimes paying a ticketing company to print our own tickets at home. So let's take a look at the app. Um, our co-founders are a company uh, called Us2, who are the award-winning studio behind Monument Valley that you would have seen in the new series of House of Cards. Um, they've also made apps for Barclays, H&M, and, uh, and many other major clients. Um, there's also a feature here which is unique to Dice, which is waiting list. So what happens at the moment when you try and buy a ticket to a sold-out gig? Nothing. You just go onto a page and it says sold out. Um, with waiting lists, not only can we find out how many people there is that have had that experience or wanted to go to that show, but also who they are. Um, and from the fans' point of view, if you do have a ticket for a show and there is a waiting list, you can return it at face value, which is the only type of secondary market that we believe in. Um, if you go through to the event details, we've got a partnership with Spotify to preview all the artists that are in the app. Um, we also do all our own editorial copy, um, so there's a nice tone that runs through everything we do. Um, buying the tickets is very, very simple, and then the tickets just live in your phone. Um, we can work with any venue's QR code or barcode system, um, and, we, and we work with all the major venues in London. So when we started showing people prototypes um, similar to this, people said that we wouldn't be able to get the inventory. We weren't going to be able to break this network of how the ticketing companies were working because it was so different. Um, but these are some of the companies that we, work, that we now work with, um, either exclusively with um, ex big exclusive with Red Bull and Pitchfork um, to festivals and one-off allocations with all the major promoters and, and venues in London. Um, and these are some of the artists that we've been working with. These are just four of the thousands of artists that we've had on the platform since we launched in last September. Um, and it hasn't gone unnoticed. These are some of the things that the press have been saying about us. And um, we've also picked up Best New App in App Store, Best New App Google Play, and we're in Guardian's top apps of 2014. Um, so what's next? We're just focused on growth. Um, and we launched in Bristol, Glasgow, and Manchester in April this year. Um, we're launching in July in New York and LA with a big exclusive with an artist that we'll be able to announce in the next few weeks. Um, we'll continue to expand through North America before the end of the year, and we're launching in Paris and Berlin um, also before the end of the year. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Great timing, I thought you would be. You don't even need the five minutes. All right, here we go. Questions? Cara, thank you. Um, I was wondering how important the curation is as, val as one of the values you give to your customers as opposed to the actual mobile ticketing part because I know you handpick all of the gigs in London that you work with and so on. So it's not just any old thing that's going on. Absolutely. It's, it's, I think it's really important at launch that we have this curated service. What actually we're, gonna, we're building is a recommendation. So um, the, the algorithm we're working on, um, plus the human curation with our music team, um, will actually be that when you, when you go on it, we'll actually have a very broad range of events, but you'll see more things that you like. At the moment, it's, it's, it's just purely curated and there's no recommendation engine happening. Um, and one other thing, how are you going to be able to continue to charge no booking fee? Um, obviously, obviously, we're just focused on growth at the moment, um, and we, we haven't tried out any of our monetization models, but the two main things we're looking at is all of the brand partnerships. We're already doing big partnerships with companies like Red Bull, and we think that that's going to be a, a, a huge opportunity for us there. Um, and also, importantly, people come onto Dice and spend money. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of pounds going through the app uh, every month, so I, I think adding things on that are of value to the fan, um, not, not obviously booking fees, but other things, upgrades, merchandise, there's lots of things that we want to A-B test once we reach a certain scale. So you said fa fastest growing music app or concert app, I'm not sure. So what, how do you define that? Can you give us some data? Um, no, no data, private probably or, okay, more questions. Can you talk about the mess of promoters and venues and ticketing companies in North America and how you plan to navigate that um, directly with the different. artists. I think that um, Dice is really unique because the artists can get really behind it. It's such a nice message um, for the artists to be able to send saying, here's an, here's an option to buy your tickets with no booking fees. Um, obviously in North America, uh, the big ticket companies own in some cases 100% of the box office, unlike the UK where the, they tend to own 50%. Um, but in, um, in North America, you can still get their artists allocation, um, which is what we'll be, we'll be targeting. So it's going to be that's a much such smaller... Until we reach a point when we can compete to actually, you know, buy up venues ourselves. So I'm under the impression that some of your competitors are having to go out and basically bribe the promoters to control the venues. 
Um, six, I've, been, I've heard of things of six-figure checks, them having to write in order to control a particular venue. This is U.S. Um, have you seven-figure checks? Six, six-figure <laughs> checks. Yeah, no, I, so. I mean, it's not pounds; it's yeah, bucks. Yeah, so it's like yeah. a twenty-five cents to you, but it's it's real money to other companies. Um, how are you going to deal with this this payola scheme that still exists in the U.S.? Um, we we are the, we're, we're definitely the first ticketing platform that, that fans really love and artists really love. And I think the power is really with the managers and, and with the fans. Um, we're trying to get, get back to that. So if an artist wants to run their tickets through Dice, they should be able to. If, if they're demanding it and the fans demanding it, then everything in the middle, you know, we, we, can, we can get through it. And, and this, these are the sorts of questions that we ask. That's why I put in the, the slide, like they said, we couldn't do it, because these are the sorts of things that people said. But in London now, nine months in, we're working with, you know, we work with the O2, we work with these big places that people said we weren't going to be able to get into, and, and, we, and we already are. So I, I'll go back to my data question. <laughs> Try to do it <laughs> it's, I find it difficult. So uh, how do you find that fan loves? Uh, you said the, you, the, the fans love your product. How many bookings in January, in, in March, in April? Give us a sense. Quantify love. That's a good question. Success. Um, I'll, I'll send you a, a link to uh, our Twitter love um, channel, which is every time someone like writes positive things about Dice, I, I'll send you that. We, we, we sell thousands of tickets every week, hundreds of thousands of pounds every month worth, worth of transactions. Um, and so, do you see in terms of competition, your competition coming more from people like you know Songkick, who just announced a, a, a big transaction with a, another. Uh, partner, just saw that yesterday, um, and or people like Fever who are, who are more you know, diversified and uh, will will address the same uh, customers than you, I guess, but with a broader range. So, what what's your your main competition? This is the last question. Um, we we only see our, our competition is, is Ticketmaster and, and the, the major players. We're not we're not really we're quite blinkered and not looking at other sort of startup sized companies. Um, we're we're really going for the for the, the big allocations there. Thank you, Russ. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dice. Uh, we have uh, the next startup. Uh, it's a sunny day today. The next startup is Cloudy. I uh, uh, hope I pronounced it well. From the UK, Damien Shields. All right, Damien, welcome on the floor. And uh, you have five minutes. Thank Go. you. Hello. Let me introduce Cloudy, the professional network for creatives. I bet when I said creative, you thought musician, filmmaker, photographer. But at Cloudy, we see it as so much more. Sorry. <laughs> we see it as so much more. We see it as anyone involved in the creative process. Think session musician, producer, editor, writer, just to name a few. This brings me to the first point that Cloudy solves. People in the creative industry don't have a CV or resume like most people, and that's because their history is based around their tracks or projects, not where they were. As a result, they don't use LinkedIn. It just doesn't work for them. Secondly, what we see happening at the moment is a musician will upload a track or project to SoundCloud or YouTube and they get the end credit. It's attached to their account. But realistically, there's a whole host of people behind the scenes that have worked on that project. They're just not getting the credit they deserve. So how do we know we're on the right track? Since we set out to solve these problems in October of last year, the response we've had from our users has been immense. They absolutely love it. Our month-on-month -month growth and the number of projects added to the, to the uh, site has been over 50%, and our user engagement and user interaction has increased. Cloudy's mission is to connect the creative industry. Cloudy gives those working within the creative industry the platform to showcase their life's work and the network to grow their career. Ultimately, we help them collaborate or get more work. So how are we different? When a creative publishes a project to Cloudy, they can credit all those that contributed to it, along with their roles. Think Facebook photo tagging, but with roles and to varied content. This creates a, a graph of connections that hasn't been previously available online before, and a new valuable source of metadata for, for potential recruiters. Remember credits on album sleeves? Well, this is even better, because Cloudy automatically creates a portfolio for anybody credited to a project. This gives creatives more visibility, the identity to grow their career, and a true history of their life's work. Not only that, but it also increases our market size from not just filmmakers, photographers, and musicians, but to the whole of the creative industry. In Europe alone, there's seven million creative jobs, and globally, the opportunity is huge. It's a $400 billion industry. 
It remains a largely untapped market. Uh, we see our main competitors as portfolio services, Behance and Dribble, but they focus solely on design. There's a gap in the music industry we intend to fill. Our routes and markets start there before connecting the rest of the industry. So why now? We've been working on Cloudy for several years, however, until recently, it wouldn't have been practical to launch. However, there's been several key events that have happened that's going to help us. First of all, recruitment through professional networks has increased by 13% in the last two years alone. W meanwhile, word of mouth recruitment has declined by a similar amount. In an industry that traditionally revolved around word of mouth, this signals a time for change. Secondly, professional creatives are being drowned out by the crowd. For example, anyone can upload content to YouTube. How is a professional to stand out and be noticed? Finally, cloud computing enables scale of audio and video processing on demand without any upfront logistics or costs. We have a freemium subscription model where free users have the ability to be able to upload unlimited content as well as the ability to start uh, creating the network. Of we also have two paid tiers. The lower price pro tier gives creatives more control over their content, more visibility with a higher me flag, as well as in-depth statistics, including who's viewed their profile. But the real revenue will be generated through recruitment. Cloudy will give recruiters the tools required to be able to find creative talent and a, and they are, and a marketplace for job hiring. We have a strong team already in place. Stuart and myself met over 10 years ago at the University of Manchester while studying computer science. We previously grew an ad tech company to 2 million euros in annual revenue but our, the opportunity with Cloudy is so much more. We've brought on a team of advisors with strong tech and com, uh, creative industry backgrounds, including Jeremy Silva, who's previous senior management at EMI and Virgin Records, as well as being the executive chair at Symmetric, which exited it to Apple earlier this year. Our team gives the expertise to make a real impact on the music and creative industries. Thank you, any questions? Thank you, Damien. Great five minutes. We have questions, I'm sure. Frederick. So, um, I think it's a very interesting um, idea and or opportunity. But so, where do you, which part of the creative industries are you going after? Because they, they, it's not like there is one in creative industry. There is you know, fashion, music, uh, the film industry. Um, no, and how, how do you then create a network effect in each of those to be relevant for them? Okay, so our route to market, uh, we're initially starting with uh, the music industry, specifically electronic producers and vocalists, because we see the, the need there for them to be able to connect. That then naturally leads into hip hop and urban producers with vocalists and uh, rappers. That then leads onto the rest of the independent, independent music industry, music film production, the rest of the independent film, and then eventually bringing us to um, photographers and designers. So we're taking a vertical approach at the moment. Um, we've been doing direct marketing to people so far, but at the same time, we're also going into the community and doing events. Uh, previously, we've done, previously we've done um, an event called Feedback Loop, which is for producers, which was very successful. Uh, we had a lot of good feedback there, and a lot of the people that actually came to that uh, signed up for the site, and they were very receptive to the idea. Um, as well as that, we've held a student uh, short film competition in the UK. And yeah, so it's similar things going to the different verticals. How many pros and recruiters are paying customers now? Uh, so at the moment, well, we have 85,000 registered users. However, only last month we, we released the, the pro tier. So we only have 20 at the moment, but that is growing. Um, in terms of the recruiter tier, uh, that's something that's work in progress at the moment. We've started speaking to recruitment companies and agencies, and they have shown uh, that they do see the value in the metadata that we're collecting, and they're very interested in it. But we are still talking with them regarding the tools that the tools that we can create for them. Um, how many transactions have you done on the net, on the network? So. By transaction, do you mean monetary transaction? No, no, just even if you didn't charge, how many people actually met on your network and then did, did a project together? Uh, I don't have that number. I can definitely find out for you and, and get back to you on that. So, and, so you've got 82,000 people who have registered. Do they, you enable them to connect to each other? Yes, yeah, so uh, 
Uh, as I said, we, had eight, eight, we have 85,000 uh, registered users. We have 160,000 credits. We have 190,000 projects on the site. So we see our KPI as a credit, and the main reason for that is because there's two ends of that credit. There's going to be a user and there's going to be a, a project. Um, so that, yeah, that's, yeah. that's where we're But if going. I look at, at um, LinkedIn as the obvious proxy for, for this, so you know, you will, the, the main point of LinkedIn originally is apart from publishing your profile is to connect to other people. So do you, for every member, how many connections are there current, currently to other people? On average, oh, so we have a following feature. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, on average, there's around 25 people that other people follow and keep an eye on their, their portfolio. And so it's more a follow than a connect? Yes, it's not actually, we have a follow because we, we appreciate that people may want to follow someone's career without them necessarily wanting to follow back. No. Uh, but we do have a messaging service as well that they can actually directly okay. yeah. connect through. Uh, and why charge like 10% of what LinkedIn is charging? Because we see it's a real, the real, uh, the real important thing for the for the platform to grow is the scale. So we don't want to create an additional hurdle for people to have to get through. And we believe these things should be free anyway. We actually want to we want to monetize through the recruitment because we feel as if that's where the money in the industry is, and not actually with uh, especially independent musicians and filmmakers. Do we have a last question, Tara? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering about the motivation of people to add credits, right? So. Was the reason that people didn't add credits before because the tools weren't there, or were, are there other reasons that people don't credit other people who participated in their project? Well, when we initially started out, we thought our biggest hurdle would be getting the people that own the content or uploaded the content to actually do the crediting. And we found that that's not a need at all. We obviously uh, interact a lot with our users and we do a lot of surveys and they, they appreciate that there's a need there and there's also a want to be able to credit all those because there is a kudos thing as well. There may be a project in the future they might be involved in where they don't own the, own the content and that then comes back to them. So as I said, yeah, it was, it was initially an issue we thought we would have, but as it's turned out, it's not. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Claudie. Thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. Uh, the last startup is coming on the floor and here is Fire Chat by Open Garden from the USA. So let's uh, welcome uh, Mika Benonea. And uh, Mika, you ready for five minutes? Yes, let's ready. go. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Misha. I'm a co founder of CEO and a startup based in California in San Francisco called uh, Open Garden. And we, uh, we made that app called FireChat. And FireChat is uh, the only messaging app that works even when you don't have uh, internet access. And uh, so that allows you to message all the time. We are solving. Uh, a big problem, which is when you are uh, in crowded places, so mainly concerts, stadiums, music festivals, most of the time you don't have any cellular data connection or a spotty Wi-Fi or very often not even Wi-Fi. So with uh, FireChat, we create what we call in technical uh, terms a peer-to-peer -peer mesh network. So we build an infrastructure out of smartphones and we enable everyone to be able to communicate uh, in these crowded places. And we can provide 100% coverage during concerts, music festivals, and in stadiums. So we build what we call instant social networks. What is fantastic about that for bands, artists, for people who have a lot of fans and large audience, <coughs> if you can engage your audience before the event, during with the, the event which is unique and exceptional and then you can keep on communicating with your fan after the event. We have a, a big advantage over the competition. So if you look at traditional social networks or messaging app and you want to tr try to use them during large events in crowds, they never work. But FireChat works all the time. So we are just starting. We have already millions of users. The app was launched in March last year. And uh, we generate uh, almost a million dollars in revenues. And uh, these revenues come from businesses, app developers, uh, who want to license the technology. The way we go to market is we leverage uh, our partners' audience, so the artists, events organizers, and also the media. 
And uh, these are some examples of uh, DJs who are working with us. So Danik, who used us uh, in March uh, in an island in the middle of Texas to communicate with the fans. That's Showtech. And uh, here is Armin, who used us two weeks ago uh, in Tampa in, uh, in Florida. And uh, that's a short video about uh, fire chat in action. Revolutionary, you know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, it was great. I mean, you get to talk to your fans. Uh, there was, I think, hundreds of people coming in. Wow! It was crazy. People. The fans were there to, you know, to, to shoot questions at me, and yeah. it was cool like, to interact with them. Uh. Are your head shaking? Are your feet breaking? Are you climbing over walls? So to be able to bring Fire Chat in, where they can. Uh, you know, have a free way to communicate with each other. It, it's been great, and we've had a great feedback so far. So just uh, one more thing before I finish this presentation. Um, we are just launching uh, the first, uh, what we call a, a messaging beacon, it's called Greenstone. It's probably one of the the smallest router uh, out there, and it's uh, helping to improve the network during these large events and stores the messages of FireChat and relay them to other users. Um, and we are very excited because not only can uh, help improve connectivity in these crowded places, but also bring free messaging to the emerging markets where you're going to have the next 5 billion smartphones that are going to be shipped in the next three years. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Michel. Thank you uh, for this uh, FireChat presentation. Questions? Um, well, actually, just related to, it's a very general purpose technology, right? You could use it for all kinds of things. So why is this specific use case of having an artist talking to fans at a crowded festival the important one? So the, um, the, there are many use cases. You can almost do everything you are doing normally on the internet uh, can benefit from this technology. Uh, we went into uh, messaging quickly because uh, that was the first application that uh, people were requesting to work on the top of this peer-to-peer -peer mesh network. So it was, it was, it was a natural move. Um, can you explain to me the density y you need to have your app installed to work? So let's say we had a thousand person club, there's no internet. Mm -hmm. How many people of those thousand people are gonna have to have the app in order to have the network actually create itself? So if you um, consider a dense city or a club, uh, probably 100 people will be enough to have a, a good experience among these 100 people. It's, um, so it's, it's, it's 5 to 7 percent of an urban population. Um, if you take only the smartphone population, it would be normally 20 percent penetration ratio. Uh, but with, uh, we have also not only the networking technology, but we have a stall and forward capability which reduced by three. Uh, almost the, the density required. I have two questions, one about the product and then the business. So does it work where, let's say we're all in a network, do we post to a central feed like Twitter or can I message you directly and Dave directly? So it's a very good question. We, we started with the, the Twitter use case. So today FireChat is like, a, you have topical chat rooms. With ha so each hashtag is a chat room. So it's like a Twitter meets WhatsApp. So Twitter, but at the pace of a messaging app. And in the coming weeks, uh, months, uh, you're going to be able to message privately people, even if there is no internet connection, so through the peer-to-peer -peer mesh or through the internet. And then can you just talk about your biggest customers? A million's uh, you know, a great... So it's a, it's a B2B business. It's just uh, they, they, they use the technology to, to build an app that benefits from that peer-to-peer uh, -peer mesh network. And who are they? Where are they? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big company in the US. It's, it's the first deal we made. And uh, I, I cannot disclose the, the name it was under NDA. But it's so mostly from one big customer. Yeah, exactly. What do you know about building this router? You're, you know, you've got a software app. You've got mm -hmm. DJs. You've got sporting stuff. You've got an enterprise business as one big 
contract, now you're going to build a consumer electronic device effectively. Who on your team knows how to build something like that? So we, we engineered the whole uh, device uh, in-house. Uh, we didn't manufacture it. We partnered with someone who, uh, who has that expertise. Uh, that that's, uh, started as a side project uh, just to, uh, because it was very interesting to use Beacon because we use a, a lot of Bluetooth with, with the technology we developed. And uh, I mean, so far the market has been really responding very well to it. And uh, we, we are very excited to, to be able to ship the first orders to, to people who want to order them, not only for, for events, because they want to sell that at e during events, but also for uh, in emerging markets, like I said, for with bigger uh, uh, NGOs also who want to use it to provide connectivity in places where you have no connectivity at all. So I think you had a surge of usage um, in uh, Taiwan. No? Uh, oh, it was Hong Kong. Oh, uh, Hong the, Kong the, the, the second yeah. picture I show where you, have, you see everyone with their phone, we got, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we got half a million people installing the app in a, in a period of one week in the city of Hong Kong. So that's a lot when you know Hong Kong is an island of seven million people. And uh, we, we got during that, uh, that period, the first four days of the event, two million chat sessions when Twitter was having 1.3 million tweets for the same period of time worldwide. Uh, so it was the, the largest peer-to-peer uh, -peer mesh ever deployed uh, and a perfect test bed for our technology. If we wanted to engineer that, it wouldn't have been possible for us to do it. I mean, it was exceptional. And, and so what is the use case uh, beyond these events or beyond a, uh, no, a concert or mm -hmm. you know, the, the protest that took so place? So it's, it's a uh, very good point. question. Today we grow by, by these waves of events, uh, but with the introduction of private messaging, then uh, you're going to have a daily use uh, starting within the app because that's th really the feature everyone was waiting for. But because it's much more... Uh, technical and difficult to, uh, to build, we wanted to, to start with something which was easier, so like a mainstream live uh, uh, chat. Do we have a last question? Chiara, yes. So to get back to the music use case, who, who pays you in that case? So uh, today, uh, Fire Chat is completely free. Um, and, uh, but you can imagine in the future, uh, in the music use case, people sharing more and more links to uh, different songs or extract of songs, and then we can generate money out of that. Um, and then we have brands, big brands, who already contacted us to be associated during large events. Uh, so you can have a topical chat room under the name of a brand for a specific event, and maybe they can distribute some uh, stickers with, I don't know, uh, a special discount for anything. Or so a lot of beverage companies, so Thank you can you, imagine Michel. a discount on a, a free drink or this kind of things. Thanks a lot for your chat. Thank you, Misha. That was our last company. Uh, all right. We get presents? Oh, great. OK. This is not blackmailing the jury, right? This is not uh, it's just a present. Um, OK, now I'm going to end this session by, uh, by uh, giving you a, a reminder for this afternoon. There will be the session about hardware, Internet of Things, uh, uh, at 2.30 here. So uh, please come back to the Innovation Factory. Uh, and also remind you that uh, the winners will be announced during the Media Innovation Show tomorrow, Sunday, at uh, 4.30 in the main room on Riviera 7. So please come and uh, check who's going to win. I want to thank you. Uh, before to say goodbye, the great jury, I had a big pleasure to moderate. Uh, Chiara, Frédéric, Jason, and uh, you also, uh, Alex. Uh, and uh, so thank you very much to everybody here. We had a great audience. And, uh, and I'll see you uh, go tomorrow and Sunday at the main room to see who's going to win uh, the uh, Medium Lab uh, competition. Bye-bye. Thank you.